Uh, thank you everyone for being here today. I'm Sarah Carr. I'm coordinator of the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network, which is co-coordinated by Octo and NatureServe. And also we have on as my uh, co-host Ray Everard, who's project manager for Open Channels, who is with Octo. Um, and we're super pleased today to have Alistair Hobday and Eric Oliver. Alistair from the Syro Oceans and Atmosphere down in Hobart. It's very early for him and we appreciate him getting up so early to come talk today. And Eric Oliver, who's at the end of his work day, and we appreciate him staying late to talk to us today. He's with, at, at Dalhousie in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, and they're going to be speaking today about marine heat waves, trends, impacts, attribution, and software. Um, before I turn it over to them, I just did want to let everyone know how to ask questions. So there's two ways to ask questions. You can uh, type the questions into the chat or the Q&A section. Both will reach us. Um, with the chat, you also have the option to send messages to everyone uh, who is attending the webinar. And we leave this functionality open because if you did have something pertinent to the topic that you wanted to share, uh, do feel free to use that, but please use it in a professional manner. Uh, but questions sent in either through the chat or the Q&A section will reach us and we can ask them during the question and answer section um, after the presentation. But thank you everyone for attending today, and I'll turn it over to Alistair and Eric. Hello everyone. You're looking at the first slide of the PowerPoint, and I'm on the left. I'll present uh, the first half of the webinar, and then Eric on the right will talk to you about the second half, and then both of us will be um, happy to answer questions. We're two presenters talking about marine heat waves, but we represent a larger group of researchers around the world called the Marine Heat Waves Working Group. And the Marine Heat Waves Working Group is, sorry, I'm just having trouble advancing to the next slide, Sarah. There we go. The Marine Heat Waves Working Group got together in about 2015. Um, we've had a series of workshops and progressed through a number of activities around identifying and understanding the effects of marine heat waves, which we'll talk to you about um, in the rest of this presentation. Marine heat waves are just one example of an extreme event. Things like cyclones and hurricanes, storm surges, tsunamis, deoxygenation events and upwelling events are all challenging our ocean spaces at the moment. Um, each of them have particular events that make it difficult for the animals that live in the region, the habitats on which they depend, or the humans who depend on marine resources, as I'll show you. We're particularly in, interested in marine heat waves because they're an, they're an expression of a changing climate system. And in the figure on the left, is a pretty common one that just shows the distribution of temperature in a particular region. And under climate change, we're expecting things like the average temperature to increase. And so a bell curve moves slightly to the right, indicating a shift in the peak temperatures. That also gives you an increase in the extreme temperatures. And we are seeing, in the case of land events, more terrestrial heat waves, and in the ocean as well, more extreme marine heat waves. And so this changing event frequency is a stress test for the future. And so the lens that I'll present to you today is that marine heat waves are a chance to examine what will happen in the future and test our management systems far, be, far ahead of the average temperature reaching critical levels. And as it's a climate change angle, Eric will pick up later in the presentation and talk about why there's been an increase in marine heat waves and what we can understand from that uh, from a climate change perspective. Really common and well-known marine heat waves to specialists like us um, include the Northwest Atlantic marine heat wave in 2012, an event in Australia in 2011 off the west coast, and in the Mediterranean in about the year 2003 was perhaps the first and most prominent event, and that was associated with a massive terrestrial heat wave over Europe that killed tens of thousands of people due to heat stress. When marine heat waves occur, they affect biology in a range of ways. Species change the location in where they live. And so, for example, in the Western Australian event, many unusual species were pushed further south by the warm water. The warm water also killed habitats, and the bottom two panels on the left illustrate a before and after picture associated with the a marine heat wave event. And similarly, on the right hand side, examples of what happens to marine habitats in cooler water when they're hit by marine heat waves. You see loss of algae and um, loss of the animals that depend on those environments. But in general, while we had documented 
impacts of various hot events, we really lacked a global understanding about the distribution, frequency, and intensity of marine heat waves. And so this is about um, understanding then, how do we understand marine heat waves so that we can better prepare management? And again, this idea that marine heat waves are really a stress test for management. In the case of the Northwest, Northeast Pacific marine heat wave in 2015, which is known as the blob, that impacted right through the food chain. And so as a manager of a marine ecosystem, for example, I might have had to cope with an increase in a, in a species that we didn't typically see in an area, or as a fisheries manager, closing a fishery due to an outbreak of toxic algae. Um, with regard to seabirds or seals, how do I handle lots of dead animals washing up on a beach and the concerns that that brings uh, to the public that are using those beach areas? And so these, these really strong hot events cause a lot of problems in the coastal space. And as a result of that, managers are getting a really early look at what warm water might mean in their region. Marine heat wave research is pretty new. And this is a quick timeline as we see it of what's, hap what's happened. In the, in the beginning and really following this 2003 marine heat wave in the Mediterranean were reports of, wow, we're getting some hot water. And that was about a decade or so concluding with regional reports of what's, what began to be called marine heat waves with the Western Australia, the Northwest Atlantic and the Northeast Pacific. Our work with the Marine Heat Waves Working Group then led to a definition of what a marine heat wave is, and I'll go to that next. We've then developed other approaches about attributing how marine heat waves are influenced by climate change, a study of global trends, is the frequency of marine heat waves really increasing over time, um, some work about defining marine heat waves, and again, I'll explain those two red things in the next few slides of my half of the presentation. And it also allows us to do some comparative work, like, what are the physical patterns and drivers behind marine heat waves? What are the biological impacts of them? And what are different flavors? The cutting edge at the moment is on real time evolution of marine heat waves and prediction. And those again are two advantages for coastal managers if they can track things in real time or even provide warning to the, the resource users or other managers of, a, of an area. So the first step that our group undertook was to qualitatively define a marine heat wave. And a definition of a marine heat wave is that it's a discrete, it has a start and an end, and it goes for a fairly long period of time of hot water at a particular location. It's important to note that this is not limited to a particular time of year. So we can have marine heat waves in winter and they represent anomalously warm water for that time of year. Once we had this qualitative definition, we were able to then make a quantitative description of a marine heat wave. And we developed our definition from that used for atmospheric marine heat waves. And an atmospheric marine heat wave is counted as anything above the 90th percentile of temperatures that are experienced at a, lo at a location. We've used the same definition in the ocean. So any temperature at a region that is above the 90th percentile that's expected in that area at that time, is defined as a marine heat wave if it persists in those conditions for at least five days. On land, the definition is three days. In the ocean, it's five days. If, if temperatures cool just slightly, as long as that cooling doesn't last for more than two days, then we'd still consider that to be a single marine heat wave event. Given that we have this definition, we can now create a set of metrics with any marine heat wave. And so in the panels, on the right hand side, the top left called panel A just, to, just shows with the vertical dotted line where the 90th percentile is in that area. So for that time of year, anything above that threshold value would be defined as a marine heat wave. So on the right hand side, panel B, you can see that definition, that dotted line progressing through time. And there are small periods where the sea surface temperature is above that threshold. The blue line represents the average conditions that you would see at that time of year. So in point C, panel C, we can see the blue line is the typical temperature we would expect at that time of year. The red line is the observed temperature. If it's less than five days, it's just a heat spike and we don't call that a marine heat wave. But if it is above that threshold value for five days or more, then it, be, then it is called a marine heat wave. And depending on the rate of onset, the rate of decline 
the height above the threshold value, and the duration. We can define a whole bunch of metrics that will give us a unique description of that marine heat wave, like the duration, the intensity, and so on. Once we've got those definitions and the metrics, we can distinguish different types of marine heat waves, which may have different effects on the marine environment. So this, shot, this panel just shows, for example, a symmetrical marine heat wave in panel A that warms above the average temperatures and then decreases fairly evenly. In panel B is one that approaches very rapidly and then takes a while to deteriorate and so on. And the reason we wanted to distinguish these flavors is they might have different biological outcomes and there might be different flavors that make a difference to marine heat waves. So once you've got a particular definition, what does it let us do in terms of understanding marine heat waves? It allows us first of all to make comparison amongst different regions and say, well, how did these events differ? The second thing it can do is let you build a very detailed description of it in an area of extreme events, and they can be used to help resource users or managers understand past history. We can understand different flavors of marine heat waves and how they influence the biology or the people who depend on, those, on the biology. They're useful for understanding the drivers of marine heat waves, attributing the impact of climate change, looking at historical trends, uh, making projections to the future, providing clear communication to media and other interested um, ocean observers about what's happening in the ocean. And then finally, it will help us with very short-term prediction over periods of uh, weeks to months. The first example then is a comparison of marine heat waves across regions. And I use three examples, the Western Australian event in the first column, the Mediterranean event in the middle column, and the Northwest Atlantic in the right-hand side. And you can see, a, the top row just shows the intensity of temperatures above the average for each of those events. The second row shows then our definition and the br bright red color is when the marine heat wave period was defined. Finally, in the bottom set of nine panels, you can see descriptions of how that particular marine heat wave event compared to others in the past, because these are time series from 1985 or so to the present. And you can see how the current event in red, or the, sorry, the largest event ever seen in red, or the current event that's indicated in yellow, compared to the historical record. Those metrics, again, let us understand the past history of marine heat waves in a region. They also provide detailed descriptions. And here's a study that Eric led in Tasmania that showed off the East Coast an analysis over a 1993 to 2015 period where we identified almost 400 different marine heat wave events. And you're able to then create a whole bunch of metrics about those events and understand what impact they've had in the past. They also let us distinguish different flavors of marine heat waves. And in the second study, of the region that Eric used to work in with me in Tasmania was around the different flavors of marine heat waves. And so because a marine heat wave is influenced by both the temperature of the atmosphere and the patterns in the ocean, those make different contributions to give us different flavors of marine heat wave. And so the panel on the right just shows 12 different flavors that we identified. And going in the X axis is where the influence of the atmosphere or air temperature becomes more predominant. On the y-axis is where the influence of the ocean, in our case, the East Australia current becomes more predominant. And in each case, the wind patterns, which are indicated on these, these things change also. So again, depending on what type of marine heat wave it is, it may have different outcomes. It may last for different lengths of time and so on. And this sets us up very well for understanding the dynamics of marine heat waves. It's really important to be able to communicate the effect of marine heat waves, and that's been particularly useful for things like communicating the effects of cyclones or hurricanes. So we're very familiar with names like Katrina or Harvey or Cyclone Tracy in Australia. Um, particular events like bushfires, which are extremes in Australia, get named around days of the week. And these are very, very important communication techniques. The problem with the naming convention for cyclones and hurricanes and bushfires is it doesn't tell you where it was or what year it was. So unless you experience that event, maybe that naming convention is not as useful as it could be. So we've tried to design 
both a categorization and a naming scheme now for marine heat waves. And just like cyclones have particular strengths, we think that marine heat waves shouldn't be just described as a yes or a no, but having categories of intensity. Um, if you have a categorization scheme, just as you have for cyclones or hurricanes, you can then report in real time, we've got a category two marine heat wave emerging, or it's got to category three, now it's in decline, it's category two and so on. Um, we needed then a metric that shouldn't be very complicated and could be widely used. So our categories of marine heat waves that we've developed are based on intensity. It's as illustrated in the figure on the right, depending on how much the time series of temperature is exceeding the baseline climatology, we could describe this as a category one, two, three or four marine heat wave with corresponding names such as moderate, strong, severe or extreme. And these categories then become very useful for comparing events. So this is an example for the Tasman Sea marine heat wave in 2015. This heat wave was 2.7 degrees above the expected temperature at that time of year. It lasted for 252 days and it was in the brown color, a moderate heat wave for 59% of the time and it was characterized as a strong heat wave for 41% of the time. And so in the panel below, you can see the bone color representing the moderate heat wave and the orange color representing the time at which it was a strong heat wave. And then in the upper right hand plot, we can also show you where those temperature anomalies were distributed. And so different parts of the, this region experienced moderate, strong or severe temperature effects. And again, that helps us understand why the biology response in the ocean might vary. Similarly, the Northwest Pacific, this event, Northeast Pacific, oh, sorry, lasted for 711 days in the region. It cycled through two summers and in the winter. And from the plot below, we can actually see that the heat wave effect was really characterized as severe during the winter period. So animals that were expecting cooler temperatures in the winter were not, were not receiving those. In this case, it was in the severe state for 13% of the time. The Western Australian event was a fairly simple marine heat wave that lasted for 66 days and it made it into the extreme category for 12% of those 66 days. Again, we would expect most biological effects, direct effects such as mortality to have occurred around March 2011 because that's when the marine heat wave peaked. Again, in the upper right panel, you can see where that marine heat wave was occurring off the coast of Western Australia. So imagine now then that we've got this system running in real time and using the Northwest Atlantic example of 2012, we could use this as a really strong communication and engagement tool. So we might be watching the marine heat wave, which now begins by March 2012, we're seeing that it's become a moderate event. We might choose to issue a media release. Through to May, the event's gone into strong and back to moderate, and so on. And then you can see in my animation an example of what a real time evolution of this marine heat wave event would look like and how we might be able to use these categories to communicate that to a range of stakeholders. By, giving it, by looking at these different categories, we can also show how these events have increased over time. So for example, in the panel on the left, the orange circles over time show us that there's been a 24% increase in the historical record of category two marine heat waves. That's illustrated on the right hand side with a comparison of two really, really um, significant El Nino years, where in 1982, we can see how much of the ocean was experiencing marine heat waves, which was much less than in 2016. And that's probably because we have the climate warming signal accelerating between 1982 and 2016. But again, from a snapshot, you can see which parts of the ocean experience different levels of marine heat wave. So by having both a scale, strong, extreme, severe for marine heat waves and a name for it, we can now provide a category and a formal name, just like things like hurricanes or earthquakes or storms have. And so, we will move marine heat waves from being an event that is without a category or scale and has no formal naming into something that can be much better described compared amongst 
um, different regions and communicate it to the public. And so our suggested naming convention for marine heat waves is that you use some name that describes the area that, that it took place in and the year. So an example of a good name for a marine heat wave might be the Tasman Sea 2015 marine heat wave. And that lets us, anyone from around the world, locate that event and understand what period of time it occurred. Eric, will you switch to your screen, please? Hello, everyone. Um, just bear with us for a second while I transfer the screens over. So can everyone see a slide? Eric, we're getting some feedback from you. Do you have two microphones open, possibly? I do not. Is that better? Okay, well, keep going and I'll, uh, I'll let you know. Okay. Um, can everyone see the slide that says annual time series? Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So Alistair reviewed the definition and categories and uh, some of the history behind this field, and I'm going to uh, follow on from there and talk about how applying the definition we can look at long-term changes, future projected changes, and I'll, I'll briefly review the available software implementations for, the, for this definition that we've discussed. <clears throat> so, given this definition of a marine heat wave, and given a time series of sea surface temperature, we can calculate the historical marine heat waves from that time series. And we saw that, Alistair showed that for a couple locations around the world. <clears throat> now, given that, and I'm showing an example here for a point location off of southeastern Tasmania, so given a time series of sea surface temperature from this location, say from satellite data, we can calculate the uh, historical record of marine heat waves, and that's shown in the top left panel there, just the each bar is showing the intensity of all the events over the historical record. And then from that, we can calculate a set of annual metrics. So for example, we could say how many events have occurred within each year, and that's just a number between zero and some, some positive integer. And that's what's shown on the top right. So some years have had no events. Much of the 90s had no events in this location. Some years, like 2001, had 11 events in that year. We can also calculate the, say, annual average duration. So the average duration of all events in, in a year, or the annual average intensity, or other metrics like the total number of days spent in a heat wave, the maximum intensity of a heat wave, and so on. And the power of this is that this then gives us a regular time series in the sense that it's regularly sampled in, with a regular sample rate for which we can look for long-term changes or even just look at the, the mean background state. And so this has been done um, within the Marine Heatwaves Working Group, looking at the satellite sea surface temperature data set, so 1982 to 2016. I believe in the publication it's 1982 to 2017. And these are the results from the satellite data over that time period. The left column shows the mean marine heat wave properties for the top row being frequency, middle row being intensity, third row being duration, and then the bottom row is just the SST itself for reference. And we can see some basic patterns here. If we look at frequency, we see on average something like one to three events per year over most of the globe, though some regions deviate from that, like the Eastern Tropical Pacific has, has relatively infrequent events. And if we look at the duration, so the third panel down, we see that this, these infrequent events in the Eastern Tropical Pacific also tend to be very long. And we can in, intuit that this would be associated with El Nino Southern Oscillation events. We also see that Western Boundary Current regions, as well as the ENSO region, exhibit high intensity events, while other regions such as just off of the equator in the tropics tend to exhibit, exhibit quite low intensity events. The middle column is now showing the long-term change over this roughly 35 year record of sea surface temperature for those metrics. So just for reference, if you look at the bottom middle panel, that's the change in sea surface temperature between 1982 to 98 and 2000 to 2016. So that's two, equal length time periods at the beginning and end of the record. Most of the world is warming up over that period. There's some cooling in the Pacific, and that's largely related to some internal variability, or rather natural variability associated with the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. 
And if we look at the marine heat wave metrics, we also see that much of the globe is experiencing an increasing frequency of marine heat waves, an increasing intensity of marine heat waves, and an increasing duration of marine heat waves, with some notable exceptions, especially in the Pacific and parts of the Atlantic. But if we look at a global average, <clears throat> which is now shown on the right set of columns, we can see that all of these metrics have a statistically significant increase over this historical record. So the black lines in these panels are showing the globally averaged metric for each year from 1982 to 2016. We can see in all cases there's significant variability, but nonetheless there's a statistically significant increase. We also see that the variability seems to occur during years where we might expect such variability to occur. So if you look at, for example, the um, frequency, so the top right panel, peaks in frequency tend to occur during or just after an El Nino event, which are indicated by the red shading. And so if we actually control for that, shown by the red curve in each panel, we see that that interannual variability is, is much flattened and the long-term trend becomes much more clear. So natural variability is contributing to global variations, but nonetheless, uh, a significant long-term trend is evident. Now th those time series are relatively short if we wish to discuss climate change. And in order to analyze marine heat waves, we really need a, a high sample rate of, of water temperature. So daily, ideally, in order to apply the marine heat wave definition. And there are a few stations around the world which have recorded daily uh, temperatures in coastal regions. And so we looked at these records, some going back 100 years. We're showing some from the west coast of the US, Norway, uh, the UK. There are records in Western Canada as well. And, and a consistent picture we see from these point locations is that we certainly see more events over the entire 100 to 115 year record that these stations allow us to look at. Perhaps not necessarily longer or more intense events, uh, but the data, the data definitely poses some challenges when, when, when looking at, at them going so far back in time. But we, we do, the, these records are very useful for, for looking back over the early 20th century. However, they are certainly biased to the point locations in which they exist, which tends to be in the northeastern part of northern hemisphere bas basins, unfortunately. We do, however, have lower frequency in time, global records of sea surface temperature going back perhaps to the early 20th century. And so is there anything we could do with those? And we actually used these long-term stations as a test to say, well, what if we only had monthly sea surface temperature data. Could we, could we recover the annual metrics, marine heat wave metrics that we got from the, the actual daily data? And it turns out that using monthly temperature data, we can develop proxies for marine heat wave frequency. So that's shown in the top panel. The red curves are showing our prediction of marine heat wave frequency by using the monthly data. We can also predict reasonably well duration, which is shown in the bottom panel. Unfortunately, we could not come up with a decent predictor for intensity. But nonetheless, moving forward, we could use global records of monthly sea surface temperatures to reconstruct frequency and duration of marine heat waves. So now shown on the left panel here is the long-term change between the early 20th century, 1925 to 1954, and uh, the most recent 30-year period, 1987 to 2016, for marine heat wave frequency on the top, duration in the middle, and total days on the bottom. This is a new metric, but it's basically the, the combination of frequency and duration. It's the number of days per year that are part of a marine heat wave. So that's a number between zero and 365. The hatching in these panels indicates that there's a, a significant agreement amongst the five different sea surface temperature data sets that we use, and those are shown in the, in the legend in the panels to the right. So much of the globe is experiencing an increasing frequency and duration of these events and, and also an increasing total number of days per year. Now the right hand panel is again showing a globally averaged view, globally averaged time series of these metrics. And again, we see a consistent 
rise in all of these metrics. And, and as a global average, we see that between the two time periods considered, so early 20th century to the most recent 30 year time period, there's an increase by, of 34% in the frequency of marine heat waves, the annual frequency, an increase of about 17% in the average duration of these events. And when we combine these two, so we're getting more events and they're longer, we see that there's a 54% increase in the total annual marine heat wave days. So this means that any region around the globe on average is now experiencing about 50% more days per year than it did in the early 20th century that are marine heat waves. So that's possibly a significant addition of stress to marine ecosystems. <clears throat> now looking to the future, IPCC, projects that the global ocean will continue to warm throughout the 21st century with the top 100 meters projected to be somewhere up to two degrees Celsius warming depending on the emission scenario, but certainly most of the ocean experiencing positive warming. And therefore we can expect these ex historical trends to continue into the future. And this raises significant questions such as will they accelerate and what will be the, the future impacts on marine ecosystems and fisheries. We've had an early look at marine heat waves in the global climate models. So looking at daily sea surface temperature from a selection of CMIP-5 models, we calculated the marine heat waves from the historical NAT simulation. So these represent a historical world without uh, greenhouse gas emissions and other anthropogenic gas emissions. So it represents a world without uh, human influence on the atmosphere. We analyzed the marine heat waves in a historical run, so this now includes anthropogenic emissions, as well as two future projections under different emission scenarios. And just, just to summarize, we see, if you look at the middle panels, the global distribution of change from the middle of the 21st century to, to say, the present climate, a significant increase agreed across the models in the intensity of marine heat waves, and a significant increase across the models in the number of days per year that is part of a marine heat wave. And the bottom panel shows a global average time series of these two metrics. So the black line shows the global average, if we look at the bottom left, the globally averaged intensity of marine heat waves in degrees Celsius, with the, sh the gray shading around that indicating the, the range amongst the different models that we analyzed. The red and the green indicate the two different future projected runs under different emission scenarios. So the red is a, a 4.5 emission scenario. The RCP, oh, sorry, the red is, an, is the RCP 8.5 emission scenario, which is the strongest emission scenario, and unfortunately the one that we seem to be tracking closest to since 2005, which is when, the, when these models made the switch from historical to future. And importantly, the, the blue horizontal banding there indicates the range of variability that we would expect in a natural only world. So that's coming from the historical NAT simulation. And for both of these two metrics, we can see that we've, as a global average, we've emerged from that envelope of expected natural variability, either around now or in the near future, projected near future for intensity. So I've, I've, the ranges are given there for the two different emission scenarios on the bottom right. Or in terms of the total annual days, so the number of days per year part of a marine heat wave, the, the models are saying that we have already emerged. So this is telling us that we are no, that in terms of the total days experienced as a marine heat wave, we're no longer in a natural world. We have, we have moved into a, um, a world which could only exist with anthropogenic climate change. And we, we do see a difference between the different emission scenarios in terms of the projected marine heat waves. So looking at the four different categories that Alistair introduced us to, we can see that under a RCP 4.5 scenario, the total number of marine heat waves by the end of the 21st century is just over 300. And under an 8.5 scenario, it's a little bit more, but not significantly more. However, how those days are distributed across the four different categories are significantly different. With mo in, in the, the 4.5 scenario, most marine heat waves being only moderate or strong, while in the 8.5 scenario, most of the events being extreme. And I would expect that to have a, quite a significant 
impact on sensitive ecosystems. Now, after an event occurs, the media will often ask, was climate change responsible for that event? And that this is true for all kinds of extreme events, whether it's a drought or a storm or a heat wave. And as scientists, we can't really answer that question directly, but we can change that to a question that can help and one that we can answer, which is how did climate change modify the likelihood of that event from occurring? <clears throat> and there are different ways to answer that, but one way that is useful is to do event attribution using a fraction of attributable risk metric. So this metric is shown by this simple equation where the fraction of attributable risk is a function of two probabilities. Basically, it comes from a ratio of two probabilities. Where those probabilities are, the probability of an event occurring that is larger or longer than the event in question based on a particular climate. And, and in this example, it's the historical NAT versus the historical. And so normally, basically what this is telling us is that how has the probability of an event changed, uh, how has the probability of an event changed during a historical climate, which is one that includes the effect of human influence on the climate, as opposed to a natural climate where we do not have the effect of humans on, on um, uh, greenhouse gases. So this informs the change in likelihood of occurrence of an event like the one in question due to anthropogenic influence as opposed to a naturally forced world. And this metric was originally developed for the medical field, later applied to atmospheric heat waves and droughts, and recently it's been applied to a few different major marine heat waves around Australia. So just as an example, um, the 2015 Tasman Sea marine heat wave that, that Alistair touched on, it was the longest and most intense marine heat wave on record. And so we can look at the occurrence of this heat wave in the CMIP-5 global climate models and look at the probability of this, this event from occurring in these different climate models and see how has the likelihood of this event changed between the, the world without climate change and various worlds with climate change. And why I say various worlds is that we have historical as well as future projected worlds. Um, I won't go into the details here, but if you're interested, this has been published in 2017 where we, we discuss ways of bias correcting the models. So the models are not perfect. They, they may not get the frequency or intensity of events correct, but there, there are ways to bias correct for that. But moving beyond, I won't discuss that in detail. Um, using this, this method, we, we can generate what's called an attribution statement. So there are different ways to do that. And one way to do that is to say, is to pick the second largest event or second longest event. And, and the reason for doing this is because that means the, the event in question, assuming that the event in question was the largest or longest event, is therefore at least as large or long as long as the event you're, you're attributing. And in this case, the largest event in terms of intensity was 3.1 degrees Celsius. The longest event was 446 days long. These numbers are different from what Alistair presented. It's because we're actually referencing to an 1881 to 1910 climate in order to capture the climate change since then, which is critical to capture the signal. And if we look on the right, the curves on the top right are the probability distribution of marine heat wave durations across different climate model experiments, as well as the observations. The observations are shown in the thick black line. The historical run representing the same time period as the observations is shown in the thin black line. And I'd like to draw your attention to the solid red line, which is the probability distribution of heat waves of this duration in the 2006 to 2020 climate based on the RCP 8.5 projected scenario. And <clears throat> if we compare the probabilities using the equation on the previous slides, we see that there's a 330 times increase in the probability of, this, of an event of this duration. So our, our, our attribution statement is that very likely, so we have 90% confidence, and this, comes, this confidence comes about by agreement across the models. We have a very likely statement that this type of event was 300, an event of this duration was 330 times as likely in the 2006 to 2020 climate as compared to the natural world. Separately, we can attribute the intensity 
So that's the temperature anomaly. And we find that the, the intensity was 6.8 times as likely in, in the 2006 to 2020 climate as compared to the natural world. It's interesting that there's such a difference between the attribution around duration as opposed to the attribution around intensity. And this is highlighting that for this event, really the unprecedented part was the duration and less so the intensity. It's, this is a highly variable part of the world off of Southeast Australia, lots of mesoscale eddies moving around. So it's not uncommon to get large temperature anomalies, but it's extremely uncommon to get them for so long as they were at that, at that period. So now I'll briefly review um, software that's available to apply the marine heat wave definition that we've been discussing. So the marine heat wave definition, including the categories, so this is outlined in the 2016 and 2018 papers uh, that, are led, that were led by Alistair. This definition has been implemented both in Python and in R, and you can see links to where you could access those codes here on the slide. So basically how these work is that given a time series of sea surface temperature, the packages will calculate uh, the climatology, so the daily climatology and the, the threshold that we use to detect exceedances for uh, marine candidates for marine heat waves. It will also give you back all the marine heat waves, so the events that satisfy the criteria in that time, from that time series along with their properties, which would include start dates, end dates, intensities, durations, their category, and so on. There's extra functions that allow you to calculate annual time series, long-term means, and trends, like what I was showing in earlier slides. And also both packages do marine cold spells, which is simply the flip periods of time where the temperature is colder than, the, than a suitably low thresh, threshold. There's documentation available for both of these. So for Python, if you go to that GitHub, link shown above, <clears throat> you can go through the through links to the, to the documentation and open the, the Marine Heat Waves manual HTML file. For the R package, it's maintained by Robert Schlegel, who's uh, currently working here at Dalhousie with me as a postdoc, and he maintains a great uh, documentation site for the R, the R package. Now, of course, the definition is fully explained in the two papers, the two Hopday et al. papers. And so you can, of course, write your own software to implement this as well, there's no need there's no need to use these definitions, but there's some um, practicality to it if it's, if it's easier for you to use Python or R. So now I'll, I'll just briefly switch over and show some um, examples of how this code works. So hopefully you can see a web page. So this is the, the, the Python marine heat waves definition manual so just showing how it works this is this is like a, a jupyter notebook essentially <clears throat> that you can access through that github so there's some header information here about imp importing the right modules in order to do the data analysis that you need to do in python this line here imports the marine heat wave module once you've installed it into your python distribution and this this following code is just showing a basic marine heat wave detection example so Let's say we've got a, a time series of sea surface temperature off of Western Australia, and I've got it sitting in this CSV file. So it's just a comma delimited file with one column for sea surface temperature and one column for time. I can load that in using, in this case, it's just a simple data file. So I load it in using the numpy load txt command. Depending on the format your data is in, you'll need to um, figure out the best way to load that into your Python distribution. I know that this data is daily from the 1st of January of 1982 to the, to the end of 2014, so I create a time vector for that here. And now here's the pointy end of the marine heat wave code. So the marine heat wave package, which, which I imported as MHW, you'll see up here, import marine heat waves as MHW, has a detect function, and that's, that's the implementation of the marine heat wave definition. If you give it the times and the sea surface temperature time series, it gives you back two variables one being the marine heat waves, one being the climatology and thresholds. So just as an example, marine heat waves has a number of properties it can tell you. If we ask how many events were detected, it tells us there were 59. If we look at the first 10 events, what were their maximum intensities? 
these are the maximum intensities in degrees Celsius of those events. And then of course, you can interrogate that data to find, for example, what was the largest event? So I'm looking for the largest intens maximum intensity event. And then given that event number, which I've dumped into this ev variable, I can go and see, well, what was the corresponding maximum intensity, average intensity, cumulative intensity, duration, start and end date, and just print that to screen, which is shown here. So this is actually detecting that 2011 Western Australia event as the largest one on, on record. So this was actually six and a half degrees Celsius as a maximum intensity. This is telling us it lasted 60 days from the 6th of February to the 6th of April, 2011. And that's consistent with what Alistair showed. And then plotting it up, I won't go through the code to plot it. This is just Python code. <clears throat> we can see here the, the whole time series in black, the climatology in blue, the threshold in green, this giant spike being the event that we're concerned about. Zooming in on that time period, we can see, again, the climatology in blue, the threshold in green, the SST itself as a black line, and all of these shaded areas are the various heat waves detected. So there were many heat waves occurring at this time, and the, the dark red one is, the, is the, the largest event on record, which is that, that famous 2011 Western Australian marine heat wave. So if you go to this manual, you can see, you can scroll through and see some examples of other ways to interrogate the data. This is looking at all of the events on record so that you can compare them similar to plots that Alistair showed. It also goes through an example of calculating, if I go to the bottom, what are called block average marine heat wave properties, which by default are just the annual aggregate or annual average metrics, such as the ones I showed, from which you can calculate averages and trends. Now, if you go to the to, to Rob Schlegel's Heat Wave R website that he maintains, <clears throat> and you scroll down, so it's got basic basic information on the package itself. He has a series of vignettes written. So, for example, the detection and visualization vignette follows similarly along to the one I just showed, but it shows you how you might load in the Heat Wave library, how you apply the the marine heat wave definition to a sea surface temperature time series. And you can see very similar kind of results to the Python code. I will also just point out, it does explicitly calculate marine cold spells if you wish. And it's very simple to do that in both Python and R code simply by turning on a switch to say cold spells equal true. Now the last thing I'll show just briefly as a, as a teaser is that one thing that we're we're working on at the moment is a uh, real-time marine heat wave tracker. And if I'll get this website to show up, um, the, we're working on applying this definition to the global satellite sea surface temperature data so that we can generate a website which you can interrogate real-time marine heat waves to, 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 to see what's happening around the world at this time and interrogate the intensities and durations of events that are occurring. This is hopefully going to be rolled out to the public sometime in, in early to mid 2019. So please keep your, your eyes open for that. And with that, we are done. And I believe we have time for, uh, for questions. Okay, thank you so much. Eric and Alistair. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a great overview. Uh, and so we don't have any questions right now. I'll remind, oh, actually we do. Uh, but I'll remind everyone just you can send them into the chat or the Q&A section. Um, but I actually wanted to start off with a question I had. Oh, what are the best sources of information right now about the ecosystem impacts of marine heat waves? You want to take that one, Alistair? Um, it's, it's a much less mature area than the physical description that we've just been through. So unfortunately, it means trawling the literature and searching for, for example, Western Australian marine heat wave and biology, and then recovering the original biological descriptions of what happened in those areas. You know, our team is working on a large global analysis of marine heat wave biological effects, but at the moment, there's no um, global data set of that information. Okay, thank you. We look forward to seeing that when your, your group is done. Okay, now let's see. Um, a question from Ian. Will the R Python packages handle gaps in time series records? 
Yes, so I believe both packages, I can speak with certainty for the Python package, handle missing values. Um, you can tell it that you want gaps of a certain duration or less to be interpolated over by linear interpolation and gaps longer than that to be left as missing. And if that happens and a marine heat wave occurs at the edge of those gaps, it simply starts or ends at the gap, which is not ideal, but there's really, there's really nothing to be done there. Um, something that we're working on, which doesn't work is yet, is when the missing data occurs at the same time every year. Uh, the functions at the moment are breaking when calculating the climatology. And the most obvious reason this would arise is sea ice. So in areas that have seasonal sea ice cover, um, you obviously have a certain period of time where there's no surface observable sea surface temperature. And so you, you would expect there to be a gap in the data every year at the same time. At the moment, the functions are not handling that, but that should be sorted out hopefully in the next few weeks, actually. Okay, thank you. And that sort of bro broached one of the questions. So I'll just go ahead and ask it in case there's anything more to add. Um, is there a record of Arctic marine heat waves? And are there any thoughts on how to define an event in areas that are only recently clear of ice? Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting one. Um, I mean, in terms of is there a record other than the available let's say, you know, like the satellite sea surface temperature data. I don't think there's a specific record of marine heat waves. You can certainly apply the definition to the, to the, to the satellite record as it has observed the Arctic regions and go from there. Of course, uh, there are, as the questioner clearly pointed out, there are regions that are only recently exposed to satellite observations. And so, the satellites will see a massive rise in sea surface temperature and whether or not that's real. I think it's, it's hard to know what the sea surface temperature was below the ice before the ice is no longer there. Um, I would flag that one as a, as a research question worth investigating. Okay, thank you, Eric. Um, an excellent question coming up from Sean, and it's how deep are these heat waves going? Is it just a sea surface temperature phenomena? Do we have any sense of their depth distribution? So that varies significantly from event to event. And in some cases, it's been examined. So uh, a group, Meninia Rowan's group in, at the University of New South Wales looked at a record off of Eastern Australia for the depth of marine heat waves. We also looked at, at it in model data off of southeastern Tasmania. Um, what we found is that it largely depends on the nature of the event. And, and what I would say in this simplest sense is that if these events are driven by surface atmospheric warming, they're likely to be not very deep. And if they're driven more by oceanic processes, they tend to be deeper. So in 2015-16, we had the major marine heat wave off of Tasmania. That one reached down one to 200 meters depth through the surface ocean. Um, there was another event in 2017-18 that was more atmospherically driven and it was mostly confined to the top 30 meters. Okay, thank you, Eric. Um, question, uh, thanks for the great presentation. How do you calculate the percentage of time uh, the marine heat wave occurs at each scale category? Um, in, in the marine heat wave definition, we're looking for each day, what was the difference between the observed temperature and the climatology? And if it's um, just one increment higher than the climatology, it would be that day will be classified as category one. If it's two increments above the climatology, it would be category two. And so each day is given a, a category scale, and then over the length of the heat wave, you just sum up the number of days in category one, the number of days in category two, and so on. Okay, thank you, Alistair. Um, let's see, spatial and temporal extent of the study window would impact how a heat wave is calculated. Are there rules of thumbs to define spatial extent, assuming temporal extent is covered in threshold algorithms? Um, at the moment, our algorithm is done on a pixel by pixel basis. And so when you see the maps we've displayed, the, the user really has to, by eye, draw a polygon around that area to get an estimate of area. Um, because they're not always coherent events, and in the picture on the screen right now, you can see that that would be rather challenging to draw 
decide where you would actually draw your box around a particular marine heat wave. And so this automated identification of area doesn't occur yet. Okay, thank you, Alistair. Um, Eric, would you make any other comment on that? No, I think, I think that's, that's good. Okay. Um, a question from Margarita. Will the marine heat wave tracker you will launch in 2019 include historical records of marine heat waves, for example, in the Western Central Pacific? Ideally, yes. Okay. All right. Um, another question. How is the climatology computed? Um, I'm happy to take that one, Alistair, if you like. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So the, the climatology is computed. So given daily data, this, this is the assumption, um, given daily data, we'd like to calculate a daily climatology. So a 365 day climatology. So for every day of the year, say January 15th, you take all of the January 15th across the record. Ideally, you've got 30 years of data, as well as the preceding five days and the following five days. So that would be January 10th through January 20th. That gives you a pool of 11 days per year across all of, it, all of the years. So if you've got 30 years, then you've got 330 days. That now is considered one large sample. And then from that sample, you calculate the mean and the percentile threshold that you're using for your, your threshold. You, by default, we've been using the 90th percentile, but that's, that can be modified. So that gives you your climatological mean and threshold for that day. And then you simply do the same thing for all days of year to build up your daily climatology. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Uh, we have one. Oh, no, no more questions. All right. But uh, we had one last question. Um, my question is about marine heat waves within coastal intertidal areas where the thermal regimes would be influenced by both marine and terrestrial temperature. Would it be possible to integrate somehow such information to detect marine heat waves within these ecosystems uh, so as to assess their impact on intertidal organisms, organisms and design manipulative experiments accordingly? Um, there's been some published work from the United Kingdom which has looked at intertidal marine heat waves and our same definition works in these regions. If you haven't observed ocean temperature in the intertidal, sorry, an intertidal temperature, you can work out what an extreme looks like in that location. Um, and if you also have air temperatures at the same time, you could in effect develop two, two definitions of a heat wave and look at how that impacted on your ecosystem. The pe people we work with have used um, the marine heat wave information to design experiments by, for example, understanding that a marine heat wave in that area means four degrees hotter than usual. And then they might design a manipulative experiment where one of the treatments is a plus four degrees experiment for, say, a two week period to mimic a marine heat wave. OK, thank you, Alistair. OK, we have actually quite a few questions. Um, I don't know what your time constraints are. Can, do you have a few more minutes? Yeah, uh, yeah, we'll see the number of participants drop off as, the, as we get down. <laughs> yes. OK, um, let's see. Oh, let's, let's see. Have you looked at the relationships between phases of long-term ocean climatic oscillatory modes, such as the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, with the marine heat waves occurrence? Yes, we have. So, um, at least as a preliminary work. So, in the 2018 Nature Communications paper that came out from a working group led by myself that, was, that basically showed the, the long-term trends, I showed briefly that we removed the signal of El Nino Southern Oscillation from the satellite data. We also did the same from the, from the long-term 20th century reconstructions, and we included the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation and the um, Pacific decadal oscillation. So in that paper, buried in the supplementary material, you can go in and find what the space-time patterns are of those modes as they are expressed through the marine heat waves. So there's definitely sig significant expression of those moments. And I would just add that within our working group, there's also um, ongoing work to look at the role of these natural modes in more detail. And hopefully that will be something that appears uh, in the near future. And you, and you might imagine that in different parts of the ocean, different climate modes influence the expression of marine heat waves. And so a climate mode that leads to warmer than average background temperatures might in fact prime the marine heat wave activity. In, in, in 
climate modes that lead to cooling, it might actually make marine heat waves less likely. And so they're one of the important background signals that might influence the, the occurrence of a marine heat wave. Okay, thank you both. Um, let's tackle just two more questions. Okay, how much do we know about the physical conditions and patterns that drive the occurrence and location of marine heat waves? Is it possible to predict when and where marine heat waves will occur? So that's a really good question. And in terms of the terminology marine heat waves specifically, um, the physical processes behind some events have been look at, looked at. So within our group, we've looked at the physical processes behind, say, the 2015-16 Tasman Sea marine heat wave. In that case, we found it to be horizontal temperature advection in the ocean to be responsible and not air-sea heat flux. Um, I would say generally this has not been looked at globally, although I think we could relax what we call a marine heat wave. And if you think about sea surface temperature anomalies, there's obviously um, a long history of looking at what drives sea surface temperature anomalies around the globe. And we can think about this in terms of a mixed layer heat budget, for example, and there are, it's, that's a well-constrained problem. There, there are well-known processes that drive that. But certainly looking at, looking at marine heat waves in this framework and, and asking the question, well, what drives them globally? What, what are the different processes of relevance globally is a very relevant and interesting question. Um, in particular areas of the ocean, it, it's also useful to use the local weather conditions when it's in, where that might set up an atmospheric heat wave. So for example, where I work, if we have a high pressure system that is kind of stuck over our area of ocean and very low winds, we might be able to look at the regional sea surface temperature maps and suggest that, yeah, these are the right conditions that we might see a small marine heat wave emerge. But this area is really in its infancy. Okay. Thank you. All right, and last question. Um, thank you for the presentation. I would like to go back to the spatial extent. Um, so currently, how do you decide on the number of marine heat waves that occur globally every year? Does it depend on a minimum number of grid points that are affected, in quote, quotes, by marine heat waves? So I, I think this question is probably referring to the, the long-term trends, where we show, say, the global average frequency. Um, or is it how big does it need to be to be considered a marine heat wave? Well, yeah, okay, so I guess there's two things. So when, when I showed the global, um, the global average frequency, we're just assuming neighboring pixels to be in, independent. But obviously, if a heat wave is occurring at the same time in neighboring pixels, you, would, you might want to consider that the same heat wave. So there's a subtlety there that I think deserves, deserves a deeper exploration. And in terms of spatial extent of heat waves, um, Alistair, do you want to comment on that? Um, no, it's a pixel by pixel summation, and we do not require that the heat wave be bigger than uh, some size when we're first calculating it, but users might decide that they only, only want to count marine heat waves that are bigger than some number of pixels, and that's a post-processing decision at the moment. Okay. Okay, well, thank you guys so much uh, for presenting on this today. It's, it was a very new um, topic for me when I heard about it at the Effects of Climate Change on the World's Oceans Conference uh, this past June. And I imagine it's new for many of our, our, our EDM Tools Network members. So we really appreciate you coming to present on it. Um, and we really appreciate, especially given that it was at odd times for both of you. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, we and uh, for everyone whose uh, questions we weren't able to get to, I will be providing them to Alistair and Eric uh, so they will be able to see them. Um, and also their contact information is up in case you uh, want to contact them about those questions. So anyway, thank you again. Thank you. Okay. And thank you to everyone who was able to attend today. Uh, and we hope to see you in future webinars. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Okay. Bye, everyone.